Hello, uh, thank you all for joining us. So I'm uh, Marco Ceppi. And I'm James Page. And we're going to be talking briefly about containerizing OpenStack and Kubernetes and how you can get a containerized, really dense production deployment of each in under 60 minutes. In fact, even faster than that, because we yeah, only actually only have 40, like 40 minutes. Sessions, so it's <laughs> going to have to be quick. <laughs> so before we get too deep into actually how we're going to do this, and we're going to go real quick, because again, 40 minutes, um, I want to talk briefly about what is a container? What's that? Oh, oops. Cool, thank you. So when we talk about containers, containers itself is actually quite an overloaded term. It can mean one of many different things, actually. So what I want to do is kind of walk through what we mean when we talk about containers, what containers we'll be covering today, and how they apply at each of these scenarios. So to start, <laughs> Let's pretend the screen that's going to pop up in a second. Um, traditionally, all containers start at that lowest level piece, which is your hardware. So this is uh, any Linux operating system running on a piece of machine somewhere. It could be your laptop. Uh, it could be a server in a rack somewhere. It could be a cloud, potentially, as well. And on there, you have a set of familiar things. You've got uh, a set of processes running, those, those vertical lines. And that's things like your init, cron, um, SSH daemon, those pieces of software that have existed in Linux distributions since effectively the early 90s. Um, you've got a disk, some semblance of disk, could be an SSD, could be a rotary disk, could be a set of things. And then finally at the bottom, you have uh, some kind of networking typically, so IP stack attached to it, one or more NICs, et cetera. Uh, and then you're running your application on there. So you're running an Apache web server, you're running a bunch of custom code you've written, some Python code, it could be some Golang bits, you're running a process on there that effectively is executing what you desire. So the evolution of that is virtual machines. And that's the ability effectively, as I'm sure many of you know, because we're running OpenStack, to take a physical piece of hardware, slice it up. What you get is the same view, except you're chunking out resources, CPU, memory, and you're virtualizing all of that onto a hardware platform that's virtual hardware, basically. So you can run different operating systems into it. It's not a tie to the post hardware, except for the fact that it's utilizing those resources and it has them sliced out. You've got disk processes. You've got your process running in there. You've got uh, networking attached to it, et cetera. So when we talk about containers, most people think of process containers. And that's your Docker, your Rocket, your Run C, your OCID. Those are all projects to implement Docker-style containers. And really what you're talking about is a process container. The isolation of that actual process, the thing you care about, your app running, and enough operating system to provide that. But you're not loading the whole suite of tools. You don't have a NIT, you don't have SSH daemon, you don't have a cron tab. None of those things are running. You're just running that specific process. You've got some form of disk. It's usually in a mutable place. It's got a little bit of operating system on it, enough dependencies to get things running. And then you've got network stack. And what lends itself to this model is that you can stack a ton of these things on a single host. Because they're not taking and isolating resources from the machine, they're just simply virtualizing the process space and enough to get it running, you get a lot of density out of these things. You can run a ton on a single machine. And when it comes to managing these things, when you have virtual machines, it's traditional operations. You SSH to it. You run configuration management against it. You've got a suite of tools available that have assisted in building up machines from scratch to a complete running operating system since effectively the dawn of, of more than one machine in a rack. And when it comes to things like process containers, because they're so different, you need a new breed of management to operate these things. And that's where platforms like Mesosphere and DCOS Kubernetes and Docker Swarm come into play. These are all platforms that provide the operational material that you need in order to manage this new type of immutable, uh, ice-siloed process container. <coughs> the next container you'll come across typically is a machine container. This is kind of the, the, the mix of the two breeds. What you have is you've got a machine, it's got a disk like you would expect it to. It's got a networking stack for accessibility like you'd expect on a virtual machine. It's got a series of processes running. Same thing you'd find on any Linux operating system. SSH, D, init D, cron job. And finally, it's got your application that you're also interested in running on there. But unlike virtual machines and process containers, unlike virtual machines, you don't have the overhead of the actual physical allocation of those resources to that machine but you're using and borrowing the same technology that process containers build on to do the isolation for that. So as the result of that, you get a lot of density of machines. You're able to pack in somewhere around 14 times more machines on a single, on a single piece of hardware than you would in normal virtual machine experience. And it's also managed the same way you do traditional applications. 
So it's got SSH, you can do configuration management to it, all the tools you've come to learn and love will all work against these type of machines. And when it comes to breeds of containers, that's the majority of things people come across today. This ecosystem is ever expanding and always changing, however. Um, you know, just as we had started with process containers and machine containers very early on, it's being expanded to encompass more types of containers. And the last one is an application container, which effectively extends the host, does not have its own TCP IP stack, doesn't have its own file system, its own operating system, but does the same isolation and constraints that you'd expect to run your process. This is for when you want security, but you don't need the density and you don't need the overhead of having an entire operating system disk to serve a single process. And in today's conversation about containerizing OpenStack Kubernetes, we're gonna cross the breadth of these tools, how they all come into play, and how you can actually utilize them to make much more use out of your hardware for these deployments. So in these conversations we're gonna come across, on the top side you see a lot of this is the process container style management. Rocket, Docker, OCID, there's a bunch of tools. At the bottom, you're getting down to actual virtual machine management platforms. That's VMware, Hyper-V, KVM. And then finally, also LexD, which provides you that machine container constraint. These are kind of the players that we'll be dealing with today. And so I'm gonna pass off to James Page. James Page is gonna walk you through how we can use this technology in OpenStack. Um, Cool. Do some cool stuff. Thanks, Marco. Yeah. So we're going to be focusing specifically on how we use machine containers both to provide instances to users of your cloud and how we can use machine containers to containerize parts of the control plane of the cloud as well. So we'll start off by talking about Novel XD. Um, just out of interest, who's heard of Novel XD? OK, about 20 or so people. So. Uh, Nova LXD is a, uh, a driver for Nova that allows you to integrate with an, the, the LXD uh, container hypervisor on a, or as a, a hypervisor choice rather than KVM or LibVirt, for example. It has um, very similar semantics in terms of how you manage the instances that are running in LXD containers rather than KVM machines. You can use the standard Nova API, your all standard kind of lifecycle operations. You've got standard resource constraints, so you can apply, apply CPU and memory configuration to the instances that your users are using and charge your end users accordingly based on the, the resources that they're, they're actually consuming. Um, and we've also got some other nice features in, in Nova LXD because it's a very thin layer on top of the hardware. Um, we can configure our clouds to do um, what we call an exclusive machine scheduling trick. Um, and that basically means that the LXD container gets 99.9% .9 of the the hardware resources on the box with a very thin uh, uh, overhead, um, but it can also plug into things like uh, the underlying neutron virtual networking, consume block storage from Cinder still. So without any of the complexity of actually giving a user a piece of hardware, we can give them a almost close to hardware experience via an exclusive machine. Okay, so that's how we can use um, machine containers within Nova and within OpenStack specifically. I also want to talk about how we can use machine containers when we're deploying clouds. Um, so there are two projects currently in the OpenStack community that do this, um, OpenStack Ansible and OpenStack Charms, which I'm the PTL of. Uh, and they both leverage uh, use of LXC or LexD containers to containerize the control plane of an OpenStack cloud. Um, so what that allows us to do um, is segregate uh, the, those control plane services into their own uh, discrete file system with uh, IP address, multiple network interfaces potentially. Uh, they can be SSH managed. You can monitor them exactly as, as you uh, would do traditional applications. So things like Nagios or Ganglia or maybe uh, FileBeat and uh, an LStack can be used to monitor all those things just as you would normally would. Uh, but it gives us a lot of agility in how we uh, can deploy OpenStack across a given piece of hardware. So by using LexD in conjunction with something like Maz, we can put down physical servers of Ubuntu and then we can place the control plane as we desire across that infrastructure. So this is a, a kind of classic monolithic approach to the control plane where you have all of your OpenStack uh, services on the left-hand side there for the control plane on, say, three servers. Um, in that approach, we'd still containerize those things so that they're all isolated from each other. And those containers are bridged onto the underlying network fabric, so they have all the same network access as a host does, but they're just segregated from each other. And we push out the, the, the compute and storage onto its own physical hardware. Or we can think about that in a slightly different approach. So in a converged architecture, we can combine all of those things. We can run 
uh, compute and storage on the underlying infrastructure, and then we can spread the control plane again in LexD containers right alongside tenant instances. Now there's some risks to that. You know, if you get some noisy tenants, then that can potentially cause problems. But in especially in larger cloud deployments where you can have hundreds of compute hosts, the overhead of running the control plane is probably somewhere between 20 to 30 containers. So you know that's going to be a one in three chance of actually a KVM instance potentially impacting on a LexD container. So what I'm saying is that LexD gives us a, and, and machine containers gives us lots of agility to be able to slice and manage our infrastructure in a much more intelligent way uh, than where if we're just trying to push everything onto the physical infrastructure itself. So um, we're going to take a quick look at what that convergence looks like. So uh, Mark mentioned this tool, tool in, the, in the previous talk. Um, this is a cloud that's been deployed using Juju, uh, which is the, the service uh, modeling and deployment tool that we, we've produced at Canonical for the last few years. It's using the OpenStack charm set and a number of uh, supporting charms, including things like uh, Nagios and HA cluster to provide clustering within, within the deployment. Um, but the key thing here is this is nine physical machines. So we've got a complex model of OpenStack in terms of relations and how things need to be configured and communicate with each other for messaging and database. But this is actually only nine physical servers. So each of these servers has a number of services deployed on it. Um, so some of them don't have very much on it. So we've decided to dedicate a piece of hardware, to, for example, for the north-south traffic routing and the network services being deployed um, to service tenants in, via Neutron. But in, in some of them, we're using a number of LexD containers, which you can see on the right-hand side there, uh, for the various different components of the cloud. So we have high availability in, each, in all, all of the services. Uh, we're providing VIPs for access, and we're able to spread and manage the LexD containers over the underlying physical server resources. In this one, we've actually cheated a bit because we've got some of these servers are uh, spindles with uh, NVMe Bcache front end, which has nice IOP characteristics. So we've pushed things like MySQL and RabbitIQ on, onto that, that particular infrastructure and made an architectural choice about where we want to place those in our cloud. Okay, so taking that trick uh, of using LexD containers and physical machines, you actually can apply all of those that same technology set to condense a cloud onto a single piece of infrastructure. Um, and I was going to demo this on my laptop, but I'm a little bit short on storage because I'm very scruffy with files, I'm afraid. Um, so I've got a, um, an instance running um, on a cloud. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a tool called Conjure Up, which is a, which is a, a downstream project for, that consumes both uh, Juju and the OpenStack charms. And I'm going to use it to deploy uh, an OpenStack deployment completely in LexD containers running on this one piece of infrastructure. So uh, it's, it's an eight core, 32 gig server. Um, you can do it in a lot less than that, but I wanted one with an SSD to give you uh, some nice IO characteristics. So a typical modern laptop, 16 gig of RAM, four cores and an SSD that's completely feasible to do this on. So I'm going to kick this off. It does take a little bit of time, and then I'm going to hang out, hand over to Marco to uh, talk a bit more about um, OpenStack and, and uh, Kubernetes specifically. So let me just kick this. And hopefully in about 15 minutes, when Marco's finished talking, we'll have a, a cloud we can spin up some instances on. Yep. Let me show you. Uh, no, it's a cloud instance. I'm, I'm not doing it on my local machine because we wouldn't be able to change the slides while it deploys. It's quite intensive on our Sorry? All in one. All in one, yeah. It could absolutely be your laptop. In this case, I don't think James's poor little ThinkPad might be able to hold up <laughs> with presenting. And present at the same yeah. time. That's <laughs> the so. Okay, so I'm going to hand back to Marco now, and he's going to talk about... Let's, uh, Okay, so this approach allows you to make basically your laptop or a single server the first part of your pipeline in how you approach deployment of OpenStack. So taking that from uh, developing and affecting a change into your architecture or configuration for your cloud and then taking that through kind of testing and production environments. You can use exactly the same tools and concepts just with difficult, different architectural choices in terms of placement uh, to take, uh, say, a config change or a charm change through that in entire process. Okay, Marco, Kubernetes. So who here is actually running Kubernetes today? Cool, a few of you. 
Uh, how many in the room are actually looking to get to using Kubernetes in the near future? Yeah, quite a few of you all. Great. So I'm going to talk briefly about <clears throat> Kubernetes and Kubernetes as an architecture and where we can apply a lot of these same characteristics that we do for OpenStack, containerizing control plane services, um, and even using LexD to provide CPU pinning and other isolation mechanisms in the Kubernetes. But first, I just want to walk through, because generally speaking, Kubernetes at, at an OpenStack summit is pretty much a new topic, I think. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time just walking through what Kubernetes is as an architecture level. And so Kubernetes is, at its core, is a means for coordinating containers. And so what this provides is that same infrastructure, that same language, the same mechanism for managing Docker and Docker-style process containers um, in a reusable, reliable API fashion, much in the same way that OpenStack provides you a consistent API entry point for managing machines. Uh, Kubernetes aims to solve that same problem for that Docker layer, that process-style container. And so it commoditizes and provides you the means for abstracting compute, network, and storage much how OpenStack does for VMs, but at that container level. That's ultimately the goal for this project. Um, you'll notice that they'll be opening up, or they have opened up support for other container mechanisms. So it's not just Docker anymore today. You can use uh, Rockets, and as more different process container uh, projects spring up, we imagine we'll see those supported in Kubernetes as well. So this is tandem out to them adding hypervisor support for different types hypervisors where the container runtime has changed. So Docker isn't the only one available. Uh, Rocket from CoreOS, there's also the OCID project, there's uh, Container D in general, um, and lots of different projects that aim to provide uh, varying features where Docker doesn't necessarily fill the gaps for those projects. So, ah. Because, open, because Kubernetes is providing this mechanism, because it's doing it around container processes, it actually gains a lot of different feature sets that we necessarily haven't seen before or have struggled seeing on different platforms. And these are things like being able to roll out and roll back. This is, I deploy a change, and if something goes wrong, I can just roll it back to the previous version. Because we're dealing with a, such a smaller surface area, a process container is an immutable device that's a single process running that is essentially a snapshot on disk of a file system. And because of that, we gain a lot of additional extra primitives much in the same way we gained flexibility with VMs when we moved into things like OpenStack clouds. Being able to migrate a VM between hosts is unheard of for a rack, uh, rack system because you'd have to literally go and plug it, move it somewhere else. So because we keep moving up the stack of technologies, Kubernetes provides additional primitives that we never really haven't seen in full force before in other platforms. Um, I wrote these pretty quickly here. So it's being able to scale up and scale back. While those are available today, it comes natively out of the box with things like Kubernetes because they are, again, those little pieces of processes. Spinning up 10 more of those things is a very cheap um, and inexpensive operation. Uh, service discovery and load balancing and self-healing are all additional primitives in, uh, in addition to more, where self-healing being that because these are process containers and they're very easy to, to have observability into that stack, because of how small the surface area is for those items. It's very easy to see, oh, I'm, I'm expected to have 10 of them, I only have four. Because it's so cheap to scale up, I'll just add a few more of those things. And so Kubernetes has those components and, and mechanisms to manage those kind of features. Um, and Kubernetes at its core is really built up of these three pieces. Um, so we talk about Kubernetes, I'm always gonna be referring to Kubernetes in a production grade. So absolutely, if you want to go and set up a Kubernetes today, you can just go download and run etcd somewhere. You can go download and run Kubernetes somewhere and connect those components up. But when I talk about deploying Kubernetes and what a Kubernetes looks like, I'm talking about a production grade one. And for those, you need three things. Well, first, you need Kubernetes, and that's the third most icon on the right. You also need etcd. Etcd is its backend data store. It's where it uses to coordinate all of its data for things like what versions of, of application processes do I have running? Um, how many of each do I have? How do I coordinate across multiple pieces of a cluster? And the last one is you need TLS certificates. You need some form of certificate authority, uh, whether that's you using Let's Encrypt to grab certs from a public domain or buying them through any certificate provider or using something like EasyRSA or Vault to do your own in-house private key infrastructure management. And those three things are the main components that comprise a Kubernetes cluster. So it is, because the surface area of process containers is much smaller, the management concerns for them are, are a bit more decreased as well, and becomes a bit more of a tangible stack. And how these look, my slides are blanking out, yes. So what these look like actually deployed is deployed in an architecture similar to this. You have EasyRSA, which again manages that PKI. 
You have etcd, which is your distributed data store that backs your Kubernetes data. You have a master control plane service. This runs your API server, your scheduler manager, which goes and makes sure that I have X things running, but I need Y, so I need to boot Z machines, uh, or Z, sorry, Z containers. And then your workers, this is where you actually go and run your workloads. This is running your container engine, uh, Docker, Rocket, et cetera. It's running Kubelet, which is that agent that talks to the container orchestrator there. It's running your SDN for, for networking management. That could be Flannel, could be Calico, could be Weave, uh, could be any number of the uh, CNI, the container network interfaces that are supported. Um, and running your Kube proxy service, which allows you to do networking across each of the nodes so containers can go ahead and speak to each other and address each other for service discovery. And so when it comes to deploying these things, this actually becomes a little bit more complex of a topology. So this is the Kubernetes diagram to what you need and where you need it and how to set it up in the order to do these things for setting up a Kubernetes. First, out of band of any of the scope of Kubernetes project, you need to have something to address. You need machines somewhere. Um, and what's great is, is we have a tool that already does machines on demand for us. It's OpenStack. Um, so from like looking at a perspective of where do I put my Kubernetes, um, if you have an OpenStack already, if you have VMs that you can address on demand, you already have fulfilled step zero, which is networking, storage, and a compute system to deploy these things to. You could also use things like MAS for bare metal. Uh, you can use VMware directly as well if you don't have an OpenStack cloud or don't wish to put it in an OpenStack cloud, or even into a public cloud if you're looking to experiment and don't have the resources available. That's effectively the first step for any Kubernetes cluster. The next is setting up the data plane, the prerequisites before you can even get a Kubernetes cluster running. And that's your etcd cluster, setting up, managing, configuring that, adding your SSL certificates so you can encrypt traffic, not just to the cluster, but within the cluster, um, getting your clients for Kubernetes all set up and downloaded. And this is handled by those two components. You have etcd, easy RSA, that kind of takes care of your step one prerequisites. Then we get to the more interesting pieces. We just set up the control plane. That's your scheduler, your API server, your controller leader. Uh, and then you also need to set up the nodes where you run your workloads. That's your proxy, your kubelet, your container manager, your networking interface, any additional infrastructure APIs you want to consume. So if you have the load balancer as a service, or if you have DNS available for the cloud you're in, whether it's OpenStack or a public cloud, having those mapped directly to your cluster all need to be configured. All those concerns need to be taken into consideration. And then finally, you need to bootstrap the last process of the Kubernetes cluster, which is everything else Kubernetes uses and depends on, which don't actually run as bins on disk or run inside the cluster. They actually run as Docker containers on top of Kubernetes. So DNS management internal to Kubernetes, metric collection and management, uh, watcher functionality for rectifying control loops, all that stuff runs as Docker containers on top of the nodes. And then finally, step five of this tier, if you move through all of those steps of configuring, managing, reconfiguring, is to actually run your workloads. And those are typically addressed as pods inside of Kubernetes. And that's a collection of one or more container stitched together as a workload. Um, so all that gets you to the point where you can now execute and use a Kubernetes cluster. But as we've seen with things like OpenStack architectures, we enter into different types of topologies and architectures underlying and underpinning this, depending on, well, the resources you have available, the things you're interested in getting out of your cluster, um, et cetera. So what I want to show is what a traditional, I guess, based on this diagram, what a traditional setup typically looks like, the cost of that, and then how we can use things like Linux machine containers and LexD to actually condense a lot of these pieces as containers themselves, as machine containers on a few hosts, to get the most density uh, for the smallest amount of hardware. So classically, you have a bunch of VMs set up. Um, you need a certificate authority somewhere. That's your easy RSA. Uh, etcd, in order to run it in a production grade, you need more than one. One is not enough. If you lose one, you're out. You can't just run two because it needs a quorum of three or more to continue. So at a minimum, three gets you the closest to a highly available etcd cluster as possible. But going even more into production, larger clusters need five or even nine nodes to have that robustness, the higher performance throughput, and also make sure you have the most data integrity uh, and quorum available. Then you need to run your API master control plane. That's at least two if you want to be able to do load balancing and high availability. And then finally, you run your kubelets, as many as you want, as many as you need to run your Docker containers on. And so right away, we're looking at six machines just to set up the control plane services, and then however many machines you need additional to that in order to run the workloads, the Docker containers, the process containers. So with a converged architecture, much in the same way we do this for OpenStack, we can actually co-locate a lot of these services as Linux machine containers. At the end of the day, 
With the exception of etcd, a lot of these services don't actually consume much idle resources. They're little Golang binaries that have API endpoints that just respond, save to database, read state from database, and then do something else, dispatch another message. So with the exception of etcd, which typically needs a little bit more hardware, um, a little bit more oomph in order to keep your data going, which would be the first thing I would pull out of a converged architecture. But with the exception of that, even in medium-sized clusters, containerizing those control plane pieces actually gets you a lot of density. So we can do in just three machines for the most high availability possible, you can spread your three etcds across those, uh, several masters, and your certificate authority, and also run workloads on those machines, all isolated, all constrained from each other, but still, uh, completely separate uh, and deployable, but at a very low cost of machines. So let's show what this looks like. Oh, find me a terminal. Ah. Cool. So we've got here uh, this slightly noisy box over here. Uh, this is the box from Contron. They're a Canadian hardware vendor that typically builds hardware for uh, telcos and such. But they have an, what we have here is a nine node, uh, nine machine server in a 2U form. So these are all individual sleds. They have, all have their own memory, their own storage, uh, their own compute processors and sockets. It's a really cool device. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually deploy Kubernetes on just a few machines on here without having to really burn through my nine nodes. So I'm going to do a super converged architecture. I'm just going to go ahead and type conjure up. And so what conjure up is, I'm going to install conjure up. So what conjure up is, is it's a front end, as, 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 uh, as James mentioned earlier, it's kind of a downstream project for charms and for Juju. And so much like the OpenStack project, how they have an OpenStack charms project, there's actually a set of collection of charms for Kubernetes. They live in the Kubernetes upstream repository. Um, you can go check them out at any time. And they also have charms for those additional services that don't exist in Kubernetes. So for etcd, uh, for SDN network layers, et cetera. So we'll wait for this to finish. And so what we'll do is we'll use Conjure Up. And what Conjure Up does is it gives you kind of a starting point for topology. It's a great way to compose and say, here's a starting point for a very small, tight cluster. Here's a starting point for a very large production grade cluster. And then from there, you can change the topology. You can modify it. You can execute it, destroy it, execute it again, change something. And then when you're finally done, you can export that and say, this is my architecture, the topology that I want. And you can replay that over and over and over again without having to go through the UI process. So I'm going to go ahead and conjure up a Kubernetes. And much how we conjured up OpenStack, this will give me a few options to choose from for a Kubernetes topology. So the first is Kubernetes core. This is a two machine Kubernetes deployment with as much density modeled as possible. We containerize as many things as we can, put them on just two machines. So it's not necessarily production grade, but it's enough to get you a good experience with a developer box. Uh, one machine that's dedicated just for doing workloads, and the other machine has containerized control plane services on a single host. The canonical distribution of Kubernetes is the next logical step from there. So this includes things like a load balancer for your API control plane traffic, multiple API servers, a larger etcd cluster, and a few more workers to back it. So this is normally a nine machine topology. Um, I'm going to go ahead and choose Kubernetes core. I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm going to use my MAS controller. So we're using MAS, which is that bare metal manager. Looks a little something like this. Uh, memorize address, remember address from memory. Nine nodes that I mentioned earlier. So, nah, that's all right. Uh, they're all powered off, they're ready. And what I can do is when I run this conjure up, I can go and mess with the architecture so I can see, okay, so what does the actual architecture look like? I've got these two machines. I can see that the, on the first machine here, we have got a, a bunch of containerized services. I've got just a single worker on the single machine here. Uh, I can go and muck about with this. I can add more machines. I can change configuration for components. So right now, this is going to deploy the 
uh, latest stable version of Kubernetes, which is 1.6.2. But if I was using an earlier cluster and I wanted to set up something for conformance, I could just say, give me the 1.5 version of Kubernetes in the stable channel from there, and maybe do an upgrade test or something of, of that uh, fashion. But for now, I'm going to stick with the 1.6 stable. Um, I can manipulate all these things. These give me a, a really nice UI for managing the architecture and topology in a simple, repeatable fashion. So we'll keep those changes, and I'm just going to go say deploy these things. So what this is going to do is just like it did with James's demo earlier, which we'll get back to in a few seconds. It's going to grab those components and start requesting machines from the provider. In this case, it's Maz. Uh, but this could have easily been pointed at an open stack. It could have been pointed at a public cloud. It could have been pointed at um, VMware. It could have been pointed at like it is now bare metal. And we'll, we'll hear it's going to start getting a little whiny over here. Um, but it's going to start booting those machines up. It's going to provision the operating system for bare metal deployment. And then it's going to start playing those operational codes from those charms on top of them until it builds up a topology that I've requested. And once it's done, I can export that topology. I can go give it to a coworker. He can go run Condrup against that topology on his laptop, on his, on his OpenStack tenant, uh, on his public cloud, and get that same experience, that same architecture that I just built. So this is going to take a few seconds to boot up. So let's go ahead and provision those machines. Let's get back to here. Yes. So this, these operations, the whole goal of this is to provide that seamless operation experience. The idea that I don't have to know intimately the internals of how this is set up. I'm not going to produce some snowflake deployment that's going to be hard to reproduce somewhere else. It's going to be hard to upgrade and manage. I'm going to wrap all the operational expertise from the community in these charms. They're open source. They're accessible. Uh, they're changeable. They're mutable. You can go and contribute to them. You can see what contrib contributions have been made, file bugs, and then benefit from the same expertise and operational knowledge that's going into those charms in other organizations, consuming those for yourself, um, and doing that across really any substrate, any cloud uh, that, that can get you machines on demand. So while that's okay. running up, let's see how far we've gotten with an OpenStack on a laptop. Well, we're not quite there yet. So um, what we can see here is that the, we've got a partially deployed cloud at the moment. Um, this, this also deploys Ceph in, as part of the cloud for some backing storage. Uh, that part's complete, and um, it looks like we're just pending some relation data exchange to complete. Um, and then we should have a running cloud. So we'll, we'll just have a look at, while that's going on, we'll just have a look at what that actually looks like on this machine. Um, so this is the, the Juju status output, which Kundrup is actually just querying that um, programmatically via Juju's API to, to give that feedback. So we can see stuff going on there. We can see um, that we've got uh, most of the OpenStack components deployed and we're just waiting for some relations to complete. Relations are the the data exchange between services in, in, in the deployment, uh, things like database, usernames, passwords, that sort of stuff. Um, we can see the list of Lex, LexD containers that are running, each with its own network address. That, that networking is all private to the machine, um, so that's not accessible from outside of the box. You could do it directly onto a network if you wanted to. Um, that's also an option. Um, we can see all the, the virtual NICs that have been created on the various bridges, and we can probably see it loading relatively highly as well. So um, it turns out that they're deploying, well, how many machines have we got there? So 15 containers, and installing OpenStack even uh, as DEBs is, is relatively um, IO intensive for a short period of time, um, and, and we'll use as many cores as you can give it. Uh, I think this, this machine loads at about 170 during deployment at peak time, but it drops off fairly quickly. And then once the cloud's deployed, it idles very, very low. So I can run that on my laptop and not have to drain the battery in 20 minutes. So that's fairly nice. Um, how much time have we got there? Five minutes. So you want to start taking some questions? I'll wait for these to yeah, finish Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll wait this, let this finish up. If anybody's got any questions, we'll do questions now and hopefully come back to a running cloud in four and a half minutes' time now. Yeah. If you have a question, just queue up in front of the microphones. Yeah, then Absolutely, they, yeah. Then it gets recorded that way on, your, the, on the your video. lovely questions can be reserved. So I had a chance to uh, try uh, uh, deploying Kubernetes with Juju. I noticed one thing quite special. I haven't experienced that before. Is it has uh, the Juju charms has diminishing snap. So yes. It has much bigger footprint than just normal Debian packages. So absolutely, That's, uh, so this is, this is that last type of container type that we mentioned earlier on in the talk, a snap container. 
Uh, why, why we snap things, especially Kubernetes? What snaps get us is that confinement story that we're looking for for software. So when we're running effectively, this is reproduced upstream builds of Kubernetes. While we do typically trust the upstream, this is not to say something might happen where uh, potential compromise is available or security threat. By snapping those containers, what we do is we include not just the components we're running and its dependencies, but we also provide a confinement mechanism. That process can't touch any files on disk. There's no writable space for it. It's effectively a read-only image, and it's, it gives us the ability not just to provide a security confinement, but also gives us a really nice upgrade story. So for example, when we roll out the next release of Kubernetes 1.6.3, we're about a week away, I suppose, now for next point release, you'll be able to upgrade to 1.6.3, and if anything fails during that snap upgrade process, the snap will roll back to the previous version. So it takes a lot of the burden of operational code that we'd have to write to do health checks, assertments, and then roll back um, in, in a snap format. So while they are, uh, I mean, they're, they're, mar they're very, very small in size in general. We're not talking more than a, than a couple hundred megs in total for an entire snap uh, well, master control plane. It's true, but I, I think comparing, you also have the EDCD Debian packages, which is much smaller. I think mm. maybe 10 times smaller than the snap package. Um, we can take a look at that afterwards. I'm not <laughs> sure that's quite the case anymore. We've done a lot to prune our etcd snap so, down. I mean, quite a nice uh, not to get into snaps in too much detail, but there's some nice features in terms of how snap upgrades work as well. So when you move between versions of a snap, that's actually binary deltas coming down the stream yep. for the update itself. So although the initial install may be quite large, because it is a, basically a big static link of everything that particular component needs, any updates past that point in time come down as binary deltas from version one to version two. So there's a nice optimization that, and you still get that transactional capability because the snap gets re reassembled as part of that process. Um, so over the lifetime of a deployment, I would actually expect it to be smaller rather than larger. We've actually been looking at um, OpenStack snaps for snaps of the OpenStack components as well is, is something we're, we're looking to move towards. Um, and in that case, the initial install is actually smaller than OpenStack itself because of the number of Python dependencies that OpenStack has. It, when you do an initial, say, Cinder API install, it pulls down something like 190 new dev packages on a, on, a, on a clean install at the moment. So moving to a snap moves that from about uh, 75 meg of, de of raw devs unpacked to 160 to about 28 megabytes. So it's actually a reduction there. It depends on the application, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Uh, another thing is, uh, it has dependency on the APP armor. Is that the... Uh, so, it, snaps utilize things like setcomp, app armor, and such for confinement. That's how we're able to make sure that not only is its space read-only, but that it can't affect other pieces in the file system unless we explicitly allow it to. So, for example, the API server for Kubernetes needs to be able to bind to a, a port in order to provide its service on the network. We use AppArmor profiles uh, on Ubuntu. On other Linux platforms that have AppArmor, we use SecComp or something comparable. Um, that way we can say, yes, this application, this thread running, this, this location has the ability to bind the network ports. Uh, some of those will be connected automatically. Some require actually you to say, yes, I trust this to be able to manage kernel modules, or yes, I trust this to be able to manipulate this file path. So it's a way to do. It's a way to do. It's a way to allow a very, um, a very concise form of management of what things this process can touch on the host system. Okay. Thanks. Th thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Just wonder about the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the networking uh, with uh, Kubernetes. Um, yeah. So. Just having examined recently how networking um, works in OpenStack um, using uh, the Linux Bridge and OBS and the various connectivities and the agents and so on and so forth. If you have a um, bunch of containers running on a bunch of separate VMs and you want to be able to turn them yeah. into a private, uh, what, uh, by what means is that achieved? Sure, that's a great question. So there are uh, a, a set of vendors that are all providing this kind of SDN space. So we use Flannel by default. That's what the Upstream project recommends. It's probably the most portable. It's just IP encapsulation. So it just sets up a, a set of bridges, listens for that encapsulation on the network, and then you can route between hosts. So containers and pods on different hosts absolutely can communicate with each other. Um, you can also do things like binding to the host network. If you have that ability, you can bind just straight down to host network through node port, 
necessarily the most robust means of doing so. Uh, and then finally, there's uh, a new feature in Kubernetes 1.6, it's called the Policy Manager. Um, so there's the, probably the most prominent example of that is Calico, which I'm sure may, many of you may be familiar with in the OpenStack space, but it lets you use your host bottom network, but then provides a policy routing management that simply says these two IP addresses can communicate with each other. So it's instead of having everything open to each other, it allows you to set a set of rules in addition to your overlay network if you have one or utilizing an underlay to say these containers, these IP addresses, these pods actually are able to communicate or not and just kill the communication if they try to do so without your explicit permission. So the networking space is a lot less mature than what you find in OpenStack. Um, it is up, really up to the vendor implementing the solution to do a lot of the legwork. You don't have a Neutron. You just simply have an entry point that says, this container, this container needs an IP address. You either give me one um, or it's not going to get one effectively. So it's up to the vendor to really implement uh, how that actually happens. It's not as necessarily as rigid or as structured as you find in a Neutron um, and, and the, the drivers for Neutron there. Yeah. Good question, though. Yes. So, was that Snap in? The, is that in the public uh, uh, Snap store already? And Absolutely. What was the name? Um, it depends. So, every component snapped. There's Kube API server. Um, do you mind if I hijack your terminal again? No, <laughs> I couldn't see it when you were typing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, the, so Conjure Up is just the software to do the deployment and install. Okay. Um, yeah, give me a new. Yeah. So if you do Snap Find with Kube. -E. And you'll find it then? It'll find all the lists of snaps that we have. That's something that's uh, being updated into the Kubernetes release process as well. So we'll be publishing those with the upstream on release times. Um, and that is the same binaries that you'd get from just downloading the tar GZ for that architecture. Um, these also support uh, multiple CPU architectures. So it's x86, it's ARM64, it's PPC64EL, it's S390X. Um, if you snap install on any of those, you'll be able to do those. So if you don't want to use Juju, if you're looking to, if you're more familiar with another system, or you want to do something home baked, you can use the snaps and you can use snap configuration interface to say, here's all the stuff I would normally pass to that daemon control line. And the snap would take, you should be able to leverage, you'd be able to leverage from that, uh, that upgrade process we talked about, that upgrade and rollback, um, and that kind of robust nature of confinement without necessarily having to use the charms directly if that's something you were interested right. in. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yes, I think so, yes. So again, um, on the snap, destroying the environment through snap, is it not available and you need the Juju model? No, so is you're talking true? about uninstalling a snap? Everything that was deployed by snap. So the snaps didn't deploy anything here. We're using the snap as a package format, effectively. Right. So. We use Juju to create machines. We put code on those machines to do operations, which installed right. snaps. If you use Juju to do that mechanism, you can say, Juju, destroy this model I've created, and it will effectively delete those machines and wherever, they, wherever it found them. Um, so I'm, I'm just saying, yeah. with the snap, um, all this was automated. And now destroying? It can also be automated. It's effectively a one-line command. You need that Juju model again, right? Yes, the model you created can be destroyed from the client that we've used. In the same way we created one, we can destroy right. one. And second, one, second question is on CNI. So you have um, LXT uh, CNI, you have the, the Docker that is not used, and then you have also a Juju CNI. What is that so used for? We don't have, uh, so we don't have a LXT, so CNI container network interface. Right, you yes. have, when you deploy it with the snap, it creates three of them. Right, the, the um, LXD, which is uh, the OpenStack container, and, uh, and you do the Juju something, CNI. I'm wondering why and what's... I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. We don't create any CNI outside of the SDN provided. But when the session's over, we can take a look at All right. maybe that more particular. I think they kick this off. Like Thank you. 
All right. I'll take a closer look. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you.